Good. Uwe is the first one. Yeah. Hello. Uh, thank oh, you that's for the great... Today. That's great. Wonderful. Huh? I, I, I didn't today, thank yeah. you. We were waiting for you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm in the office and need to follow uh, other stuff. It's, it's no, no, kind of horrible. Uh, yeah, but my question is, uh, um, you talked about Kling, the, the interpreter. And uh, are you still there? Do you yeah, we're still there. We hear okay, you. Okay, because I can't see you. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, no, but uh, you talked about Kling, the, the interpreter, or interpreting uh, C++. Uh, question is, there is this JIT compiling language, uh, Julia. Uh, is is it planned or is there something on the schedule to include such a thing like Julia for the root framework? So the, the Julia, uh, um, looking into Julia just starts now. Um, I think we haven't yet fully understood uh, what's in it for us and if it's a sustainable road to develop. I mean, if you pick a language uh, for software that is that that should sustain the lifetime of a detector, which is you know 30, 40 years, including you know the time after decommissioning, uh, mm -hmm. you need to have good trust in the ecosystem. This is often the problem with uh, with these very nice developments in new languages. So mm -hmm. I know that people are interested in in Julia, and it, it seems that for scientific computing, it's really uh, you know some you know, nice. Uh, you know, good good design for scientific uh, computing. Uh, Kling, I think, is in this case not your primary concern. Your primary concern is really on the on the plumbing, if you will, to to make it to make sure that your new code works sufficiently well with your old code, because you always have the legacy of old code. Yeah. I Okay, but, but then I was just wondering why, um, because Julia is based on LLVM as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, if it's so hard to do that, and if there is so much of overhead for that. Because I, I know there are bindings for Uproot and Root itself right. for Julia, but I think they are not uh, officially supported in a certain way. Um, Okay, I'm, I'm not super up to date on the, okay. like, on the specific state of, of, the, of the projects. I mm -hmm. can put you in touch. If you're interested, I can put you in touch with, with the oh, okay. you know, send me an email and, uh, and I may okay. Yeah, okay. Can make a connection. Really, really Simeon nice. should also know more about this, maybe. Hmm. Simeon and HCDR should also. Okay. I mean, maybe you can do something on the NLVM level. on the. On the C++ side, this you know interoperability is 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 you know, difficult because there's no uh, no stable API. Right? I mean, you, it's, mm. it's interoperable as long as you do everything with the same compiler from zero to hundred mm. percent. And that's the beauty about C interfaces: you can mix and match your, your compilers. <laughs> mm. That's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Uwe is also working on a um, on a, a event generator for uh, nonlinear QED. Just mentioning, so maybe we should later uh, step by a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Uwe. Other questions. Then I would like to ask one more. Um, you you showed at various points in the in the talk uh, uh, that uh, root and the various file formats rely on compression. You also compared various compression algorithms. So I wonder, and this is also backed by a little personal experience, like how big is the impact uh, of compression on the general workload of analysis? Because I sometimes had the feeling that compression takes up most of the time that analysis software actually spends on an analysis. Like how big is the compute impact that, that runs the like actual number crunching on the data? It depends a bit. Um, the simple plotting there you have is really dominated by by compression or decompression. Uh, so for the for writing out data, the the compression is. Uh, uh, it also depends how you write out data. Uh, okay, it is not. 
as dominating as it might seem at first glance. So for the simple examples, yes, you're completely dominated by compression, decompression. However, in, in practice, the examples get more complicated and you actually do have you know, some other things to do uh, besides the compression. For instance, you do not just create one histogram, but you create perhaps a thousand histograms. And suddenly even histogramming has a little bit of, uh, of CPU uh, uh, impact. Is this related to the systematic variation? Yeah, for instance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, same for writing. Um, in the, 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 the write itself, of course, the CPU part of it is the compression, but the writing is usually part of a of a pipeline where you where you do some other processing before, like I don't know, reconstruction. And then this is where your CPU budget is spent. So I think it's nice. So we can do this now with our interpreter. We can do the compression decompression of pages like in the background in parallel. I think that's very nice for like your laptop use case. If you are interactively working on your laptop, you develop something, you have maybe a few plots that you generate and so on. There it's really beneficial. When you run at larger scale with more complex applications, perhaps in a shared area where anyway, uh, you know, other programs grab the CPU that you don't grab, uh, then it's not such an important point anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, although now I might have answered a different question than what you yeah. asked. <laughs> no, no, but I have a follow-up here as well is uh, with like the new declarative approaches to describe HEP analysis, mm -hmm. uh, like, like uh, our data frame, for example, mm -hmm. where I don't write the event loop myself anymore. Uh, does Root offer uh, some kind of tool to me that where I can like trade off between like how much, uh, let's say, core, core time or like how much resources are attributed to the analysis and how much is attributed to IO and compression? Like, does root schedule that automatically? Uh, no, it's not at this level of sophistication at the moment. You 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 can restrict the overall, uh, like say, like core budget that you give to your to your R data frame. Uh, internally, we don't. And, but this is, a, this is actually an interesting question because, of course, there, there are multiple ways of using your multi-core uh, system. Um, one of them is uh, simply to go like event range by event range. Right? So you do, not, uh, you do not try to be smart within a single event and be parallel there, but you say, okay, I have events 1 to 10, 10 to 20, and I schedule this on different cores. And it's very hard to beat this because of the inherent... Mm -hmm. Parallelism. I mean, usually this is what gets you the quickest to a fast throughput. So if you have an R data frame analysis, you might actually want to use this type of parallelism. Mm -hmm. And then with, within each event, you stay serial. Like within each event range, I have I owe decompression right. and, and the calculation within, let's say, one right. thread. What you want to do, nevertheless, mm -hmm. is the overlapping of compute and I/O. Right, so you, you nevertheless want to have async I.O. so that while the I.O. device is doing its thing, yes. you do computing. The CPU is not blocking yeah. the I.O. Okay. So the next one is Franz, and he's from our professional support and working on OpenPMD. Franz. Okay, hi. So I have a question on your file model because you said that it is based on C++ objects. And I imagine for... POD data types, this works quite easily, but you also showed that it supports things like vectors. And I assume that you are, um, is there just a selection of uh, standard library data types that are supported for this, or is there another trick that you're pulling? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, uh, so here we have to distinguish a bit between the old system and the new system. So the old T3 system, supports pretty much everything from, from C++, including you know, pointers, uh, references, and so on. Um, and it does a lot of work with, its, uh, with the Kling introspection. Um, now, what, what we have uh, um, decided for, for the RN tuple system is to make a whitelist of supported types. Uh, and these are, and, and we, so these are, for instance, STD vector, of course, the plain out data, type, data types, then the, the, the standard collections from STL, and then, you know, a few more things as, as the need arises. So it should be explicitly whitelisted. These types 
are supported for I.O., but then within this type system, it's fully composable. So that's, that's, the, that's the idea. And technically, uh, this is now implemented by uh, template specialization. <laughs> so as long as you... So as long as you do not have your own custom class, you actually don't even need the C++ reflection system. You need the C++ reflection when you write, you know, my class event and then to look into this class. Does, does it make sense? Does it answer the question? I think it does somewhat, yeah. But so what I didn't get exactly, so you do a whitelist, but uh, there is, actually a generic implementation that implements these whitelisted types if I got that correctly. Or do, do you really do every single one? Uh, in um, well, I mean, the, the generic part of it is that you have the, the plain old data types and you have records and you have collections. This is sort of, you know, like the generic data model. Uh, maybe a bit more, you might also have a, an idea of a variant, and you might actually also have an idea of a reference to something else. And then you have various C++ type incarnations that, that essentially are, this, you know, are incarnations of these general concepts. Um, but in terms of code, uh, like there's a template specific, uh, you know, specialization for STD vector. Okay, I think that answers it. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience, especially from... Actually, um, just one more point on, on this... Uh, 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 on this serialization topic. Um, if you do it completely, if you do it only with the introspection, there's a problem because, yeah, you can store... Okay, it's, it's not in the old system or something like this, but let's say in the extreme case, you can store an STD vector just by recursively look, you know, you know, disentangle it into plain old data types. But then you store the representation in memory of that specific application of a vector on disk. This is not what you want. What you want on disk is the semantics of the container. So this is why it makes sense to, to do, to make yeah, one abstraction step. Yep. That's part of the reason why I asked, yeah. Looking into this, uh, what you're also saying with this is that like you would buy yourself into a specific uh, ABI layout of the vector. So like if the standard library would change, for example, that would be a problem. Yeah, this is what we don't want. So, and yes. this is, so our end tuple is written in such a way that uh, yes. this doesn't... You look up. at the salient data and not at the, like, the, the binary ABI, like visible realization. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I have another question actually. Uh, so can you maybe go back to your last, last slide or we can just... Um, so, so one of the very interesting things we're looking at uh, is uh, going, going away from disk most of the time. So we, we want to have transient analysis and uh, uh, of, of highly complex data. So uh, um, to, to give you an idea, the best one can currently do, for example, in photon science is the, the, the single event of photon science is usually a full picture that can have then that on its own can be a gigabyte of size. And you can't easily break it down to pixels and analyze each pixel individually from the other pixels. So this is a real bummer. Uh, and and uh, also usually to really reconstruct something, your the pictures are not independent of each other in many cases. So you have to collect, for example, 10,000 pictures for a tomographic mm -hmm. view or something like that. You can, of course, look at all those pictures, but they are somewhat connected and not, not, not simply statistically independent of each other. Um, and the compression you reach for an image meaningful is if you're really good and if the image is really sparse, it's about a factor of 100. That's about it. Mm -hmm. So this is far from the five or six orders of magnitude we currently see in particle physics. And I saw a very interesting plot a while ago in May that actually the amount of data currently produced in particle physics at, 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 at 
Daisy and at uh, Photon Science at Daisy has crossed. And now Daisy is producing orders of magnitude more data uh, from, from photon science than it does actually from particle physics. And part of the reason is that they can't uh, filter out what they don't need. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, the upcoming challenge, and that's already there in high, per, high performance computing, is actually that you have so much complex data that simply storing it is not a good idea anymore. You, you, you just can't. You somehow have to really do a very fast uh, knowledge extraction, so very fast compression or reduction, or however you want to call this process, from the raw data to, to meaningful representation. And uh, so I personally, uh, so we have worked a lot of GP with GPUs and Obtain is nice and something like this, but I was much more hyped by seeing that NVIDIA is buying that Mellanox because Mellanox for years has been the standard for data transport in, on HPC clusters, and they have been looking at ways to intelligently transport data mm -hmm. so that I put more intelligent into, the, into how the data is distributed from one element of computation to another one. It's basically uh, a poor version of an FPGA where the building blocks are the nodes and and with some intelligence in there and then the then the network is much more intelligent and knowing where which data is needed next so so uh, understanding this and at the same time they're also looking at uh, GPU and IO so they're combining this as well and I'm wondering on how much of these uh, up to in-memory computing and all these techniques that are com coming up from certain vendors and they're always nice ideas and then they level down again because nobody's using them. But my, my understanding was that if it's possible to tell the, the, the hardware more about the logic of your application and how the data flow actually works and which data you are expecting next, this is the this is the next level of of understanding uh, how to make this more efficient because in the end uh, uh, even in a even in any data transport you can avoid even read you can avoid is where you where you finally gain gain speed so being sure that you always have everything you need locally is one of the one of the main driving forces how much interaction is there with those hardware vendors? Because I know on our side, there's little. We are, we are very fortunate that we are talking to NVIDIA. We're very fortunate that we're talking to AMD and, and other vendors. So this is from our size, this is wonderful. But I could think that a, a lab like CERN that is a real player has much more influence and, and crosstalk with these things. So how do you see this in the future? What, what would you like to see and, and what do you expect to happen? So what I would like to see is certainly more um, uh, exchange between the different layers of the IO stack. Mm -hmm. I also think that's it's a, a key problem. Um, and it's for instance, if you look at, at certain tunable sizes, uh, even of things like uh, page size, cluster size, all this, I mean, more or less is like you know, taken from the guts. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's use this and mostly work. But it would be much nicer to actually have the components talk to each other and say, okay, now this this could be a sweet spot for the in this particular situation. I I don't see any common API at the moment to do this, um, or even like also things like SSDs or or. or, or um, Network I/O that, that you know. Okay, what 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 would actually be my my optimal Q depth in in this particular case? I don't know. It's something that we can try to figure out, but there's no no good way of communicating this. Um, so this is certainly, I think, something I would be very interested in. We do have some uh, structured collaboration with industry via Open Lab at CERN. Mm -hmm. uh, Intel is a partner. Nvidia is a partner. With Maria. With Maria, exactly. Uh, we have done some work with Intel on their DAO system. We are still involved in this. So via this, in this collaboration, we get 
often we get early access to mm -hmm. to prototypes. Uh, often, unfortunately, this also comes with NDA. So I don't know exactly what is happening in other corners of CERN. It's very well possible that, that you know more routes are explored that I'm unaware of. Mm -hmm. And probably Maria would be the right person uh, where everything comes together. And she's under all these NDAs. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. One more. One more follow-up question, maybe on this. Um, I, I. I. Sometimes have the feeling that the, the era of I/O is actually ending. It's not. It's. It's not like. Uh, I, uh, it's a mean thing to say in this context, but I. Uh, but I think it's or or maybe it's bound boundaries. Are, are are vanishing in the sense that I think in a very heterogeneous system, to me, the, the, the memory hierarchies from the smallest cache to the IO system finally, fundamentally should be transparent and thought together, you know, because there, of course, there are still orders of magnitude in throughput. And this makes it easy to say, okay, I can look at IO, from another perspective than, for example, compute. But at the same time, there are so many common concepts to just make parallelism work and, and, and get, get optimum chunks of sizes done that I think uh, more crosstalk. I, I always wonder why there is such a big boundary to I.O. You know, it's like it's like you have this feeling they're doing the same thing. You have the pages, the clusters, and so on. I just name them differently. Mm -hmm. But there's so much, so much interplay, reuse, caching, da, 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 all these things that are interesting that I sometimes wonder uh, why this is the case. And, and if you see that this convergence could ever happen. Yeah, it's certainly blurring. Um, the, the boundaries are blurring. Uh, I think the device characteristics are still a little bit different, but maybe this is blurring too. Uh, device failures, for instance, is something that you have to deal with in I.O. much more, at least, than uh, with memory. I mean, now it's also the case for memory, <laughs> but I think it's still sort of, you know, solved transparently in the hardware. Mm. And as a programmer, you don't need to think a lot about it. Um, that's one difference. And uh, But I think this is why I find this during uh development very uh, very interesting because it's sort of it's one step towards this idea of a, of a event um loop or you know one one interface that goes across your program uh, which you also need i mean in the end you have a pipeline you have a data pipeline so you need to have like one uh, on the on the on the on the programming level like a, a single way to to uh, to control it to control the pipeline and uh, yeah i think that would be useful to get closer mm -hmm. and that is simply also that the apis are often very different yeah uh, so it's on the technical level yeah that you sure. don't don't really get the things together yeah okay thank you uh, any other questions from the audience Okay, any more questions here? I think, thank you very much.